Um, all right, 7.30, so if we can get started. Uh, I'm Jim, and I'm going to be hosting for this evening. And uh, we have a couple of people who have uh, some uh, interesting uh, uh, subjects they'd like to bring up. Randy has uh, some pictures from Paris, of Paris and the moon. And uh, David has his uh, sky survey results. So uh, we'll have, uh, have him talk about that. And uh, Nathan has uh, a video that he would like to share with us, a film that he's made up called uh, Seeing Beyond. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how that uh, works out. So perhaps then we can start off with uh, Randy. If you could uh, have a- I have uh, two things. I've got the talk about the gamma ray burst, which is a rather longer talk. So uh, maybe we should do that after. I'll do my moon to start things. And then if it has to get deferred because uh, there's too much other interesting things, then that's fine. Okay, that sounds very good. Uh, definitely want to get Nathan's uh, video in here. So uh, uh, yeah. perhaps we can uh, see if uh, uh, hopefully we'll have time after that. So, so why don't okay, you go ahead with so the- So I will share the screen and show off. Do, 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 do share screen and share and F5. Okay, uh, it didn't do my F5, try that again. Okay, that's better. Put it back in the gallery. Um, okay, so uh, reason I haven't been coming to the uh, Astro Cafe since May. Uh, I spent all of September in Europe and uh, in particular a week in Paris, which really is my city. I spent four years there doing my doctorate and I'm crazy about it and have lots of friends and I, I just love walking Paris. Anyway, the, it was a uh, waning uh, moon while I was there and so it was only up in the morning and that suited me just fine because uh, nobody really cared what I did in the middle of the night. And so the first night I was there- um, I Randy, are you off. muted or is it just on my end? You not hear I'm me? not hearing anything. Do other people hear me? Well, and- I can, and I can I, hear you. I can hear you. I hear you fine too, Randy. I can hear you too. Sorry, Nathan, you've got to fix that. Oh, you're smiling, so I think you hear me. Anyway, early morning moon, and so I went for a walk from two to five in the morning. And that was uh, when I did the first few pictures. And then over the next few days, I kept going to other places. So you'll see the pictures turn from kind of a last quarter to a crescent moon. So uh, here we are at the Louvre. And as you know, uh, there are um, gargoyles up here on one of the bell, on all the bell towers. But this, these were over on the, uh, which way would that be the south side? So here are a couple of pictures of silhouettes of gargoyles in front of the moon. Cool. And there's one up, there's the moon up there. I was so moved to see Notre Dame in, you know, pretty good shape considering what happened to it. It, the, the, it didn't all burn down. It was really, the, it's just around the transept that the uh, roof collapsed and they're doing a great job fixing it. Here's the Tour Saint-Jacques. And here we have the Place des Vosges with the uh, moon hiding between a couple of the, uh, the windows up there. This is uh, Beaubourg, the uh, Pompidou Center, the collection of fine art, and with its very iconic uh, external escalators. And uh, so then uh, the next morning I went out to see the Tour Eiffel. And so there it is up there, but here's some blow ups where you can see the framework. You see <laughs> moon through the framework. That's great. I, I almost got arrested in front of the Louvre because I went to, um, you know, there were some barriers for the construction and I figured 
the middle of the night. Nobody's going to bug me. As soon as I went through that barrier, people were whistling at me and said it's forbidden. And <laughs> so I said, I just want to take a picture. And, and then for, for uh, these pictures, I was in the road at the uh, Cape Henri, um, but there's very few cars at that time. So <laughs> I'm still here. So then I went for a coffee. I wanted to catch golden hour. I wanted to catch the rising sun on the Eiffel Tower at the same time as the moon. So I think that worked really nicely. Lovely. Uh, the next morning I went to the uh, Louvre. This is actually the um, Arc de Triomphe du Carousel, which is in front of the Louvre. And uh, this is one of the big portals of, of the uh, Louvre. But, um, you know, they, President Mitterrand had this big pyramid built. That's where you go into the Louvre now, mm -hmm. is right in the middle of the courtyard, there's a pyramid. So here we have some reflections of the moon off the pyramid. Very pleased with that picture. I also got in trouble here. They were um, putting in a new display. And so uh, there was access right up to the uh, pyramid when normally um, it's, it's all barred off until later on in the day. Uh, this is the Petit Palais. <laughs> and here is the uh, obelisk in the Concorde. Okay, not the moon, but I couldn't not take its picture. It was just beautiful. So this is from the Concorde, but you can see up, up here, that's Jupiter. Oh, really? Oh, wow. You can't see it in the big picture, but it's there. It's conceptual. And was there, or was that a lucky thing? Oh, that was not lucky. That was, you, you knew was I good. wandered around a lot. These pictures are hard won. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get arrested. That's good. Um, I, I did almost die here. I, I knew that the cars weren't coming down. This is on the Pont Alexandre III. So this is going um, uh, towards the Assemblée Nationale. Um, no, towards the Envelid. And uh, I saw that there weren't any cars coming along, but this bike almost hit me. Oh, watch out for bikes in Europe. I know. Okay, here's, uh, actually, this is my favorite of the bike. <laughs> this is uh, Jeanne d'Arc, and I love seeing her look at the moon like that. That, that, was, <laughs> that was a fun picture. And this uh, fine lady with her sword uh, is on one of the towers of the Pont Alexandre III. And I finish off with the Génie de la Bastille. Uh, so um, there you go. That's my little tour of the moon over Paris. Tour de force. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. That's lovely, Randy. Very nice. <laughs> Actually, you uh, you you say you you didn't get uh, arrested. I'm uh, wandering around at that time of the day. I'm surprised that you uh, you didn't get mugged. I there was one little incident that got me nervous, uh, but there's lots and lots of people out. My goodness, there's a lot of people out. I and at the uh, Fontaine Saint Michel, I bought a crepe at three in the morning, and there was a lineup. Paris is hopping in the middle of the night. Crazy. Anyway, I was traveling with a bunch of old people who needed a lot of sleep. So I came home, had a sleep, and then went on with my day. Well, I think it made a lot of people jealous. <laughs> uh, some folks had their hands up. Did anybody have any questions here at all? Or... OK, no, doesn't sound like it. That's fine. Uh, very good. David, can you hear us yet? I can certainly hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Excellent. All right. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm going on a hybrid system here. Um, I'm getting <laughs> my mic through one of my control programs, but I'm getting my audio from my speaker on my laptop. <laughs> well, I was all and set I, to. I was all set to uh, send you text messages from this side to give you prompts as well. Oh so no, 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 no. We're we're three, okay. Three we're okay. Going, but... Yeah, at least I'm not using two laptops like I did last time. 
<laughs> so anyway, you have some results from the uh, Sky Survey. Yeah, yeah. I um, again, you know, thank you so much for everyone who actually participated. I'm I'm quite excited about uh, the results. Uh, they may not exact be exactly what you expect, but I'm I'm so excited by them. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Okay, so um, there's some new things. Uh, I, I've taken a slightly different approach. Um, I don't know how many of you know that I was taking a data science course up at UVic uh, during this time. And I, I asked the instructors, could I do my capstone project using this stuff with real data? And they kind of had a look at it and they said, yeah, okay, why not? So they, they let me do it. And um, yeah, I, I'm really stoked. And, you know, I, I really want to thank um, Martin Monkman and uh, Julie Hawkins, who were the instructors, uh, for introducing me to R, because, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I'm going to stop using it. It's, it's quite an exciting platform. So the Sky Brightness Survey, as many of you know, was initiated in 2010. So there are lots of teams of RAS volunteers then that made observations with uh, SQM meters. Uh, this, this is um, a representation of a really early or original meter. Uh, there are now uh, L meters, which have a little bit narrower cone or field of view. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in, later on in the talk. So in 2020, 12 years later, we tried to replicate the original survey. And more or less, we did. Uh, we use a slightly smaller set of volunteers. Uh, and I ha I'll have to say many were new to the process, but we were still able to collect 213 observations. Now, those are not discrete for locations. Uh, we had many new locations, and we also uh, had duplicates, which, which is fine. Um, most were used uh, from the 2010 survey, and I'll, I'll talk, about, uh, talk about that in a few minutes. So the processing methods, like in 2010, uh, basically Sid collected uh, a bunch of uh, uh, observations from a, a number of teams, and he consolidated this on an Excel spreadsheet. Now, my understanding, uh, my, my role in the 2010 survey only comes in when we went to the spatial visualization. I didn't really have anything to do with the spreadsheet. That's something that Sid managed, and um, uh, I don't... I think he may have even had some of the entries uh, on sheets of paper and he consolidated everything onto the spreadsheet. And I think maybe even the coordinates may have been after the fact, like that may, may have been something that uh, uh, Sid had done uh, using a mapping program. Um, I know for a fact that many people that did observations in 2022 were likely using their phone or some GPS unit. So the SQM readings were classified uh, based uh, not on Bortle, but on a John Flanders article in Sky and Telescope. So I derived these values. You can kind of see them in the uh, picture here. Uh, they go from white down to black. Uh, white's not very good. That's uh, uh, kind of white out almost. And these are progressively getting better as we move towards the black. So that's our our starting point in 2010. <laughs> so in 2020, uh, as I say, I had an opportunity to sort of update the processing methods. So I was introduced to an open source language called R, which is actually not really that new. It's quite old. Uh, and it's designed for cleaning data and readying it for analysis. Now, at one point, I didn't really understand what that was uh, because uh, I thought, well, uh, if people have entered everything correctly, uh, then it should be okay. Oh, Laurie, did you have a question? Uh, should that be 2022? Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, ignore that. Please, please okay. do us, please do a substitute for 2020 to 2022, please. <laughs> okay. Okay, I will change it for the for, for the final thing. Uh, so it was an opportunity to um, uh, update the processing methods, and one of the key things with the um, uh, using R was this uh, concept of traceability. Uh, so basically, uh, you can kind of massage the data all you want if you weren't using a script language, 
and not show any trail of what you did from raw to what you may have used for analysis. So R uh, is designed to allow you to manipulate the data, but use full traceability through the code. Okay, uh, the other thing I discovered that was a really nice feature of the language was I could do exploratory plots before the data was even gelled. I could do like a scatter plot or do something very quickly just to un understand the data a little bit better. And that was another really nice feature. So here's some preliminary results. And here's, here's an example of an exploratory uh, analysis where basically I got you all to give me the raw readings, the four readings where you turned around and uh, took readings. Now, there's various reasons why they may deviate. But in theory, if the conditions are right and you don't have any weird reflecting surfaces like buildings nearby or vegetation kind of blocking the sensor or any direct light from a light standard falling on the sensor, you really shouldn't have any variation, actually. Uh, but as you can see, here's an example. This is from Team F. Uh, you can see uh, the black one is actually the first reading. And then the other colors are, I think that's uh, second, uh, third, and fourth, fourth readings. So you can see there's a little bit of a variation. I did notice something very interesting. When you got into darker readings, they tend to be more coincident. So that kind of made me think that maybe it's really from light scatter or or, or something that, uh, and when, when people were getting the darker readings, they were actually in more remote areas where there really wasn't anything around to sort of block the sensor. Anyways, that, that's still open up to debate what these mean. Uh, and I'm actually hoping that each individual team will review these uh, variation charts and maybe decide for themselves what happened. Okay. So the uh, the key things here are the comparison visualization. So this is after the, the data has been cleaned. Uh, so basically I have two main uh, visualizations that I'm hoping to use. The first one I came across, because it's the first thing that came into my head, was just, just to do side-by-side -side comparisons of 2010 to 2022. Uh, so you can see there's variations, there's kind of bumps up and down. Um, the green is the 2010 and the the nice uh, pumpkin orange is um, uh, is uh, this current year. So you can see the things go up and down. So you can, you can see whether they went up or they went down. But I thought about it afterwards and I came up with a slightly different visualization, which I think does the job better and is a little bit more compact. And th that's this uh, difference chart down here. And we'll have a closer look at it. So basically all I did was I took the values and subtracted them. And basically, if I had negative values, it meant the re reading was getting uh, uh, brighter. And uh, if uh, they're up in the, this side of the, the line, then the reading, reading is darker. Now, this kind of surprised me uh, until I, I read a recent article, uh, because some of the big changes that we've seen uh, in the uh, last decade is the change of lighting. So uh, when we were doing this in 2010, I don't think there was any LED lighting. Uh, I think we just had the um, the sodium, uh, low pressure sodium uh, lamps. And apparently I, I did read a, a article recently uh, where somebody did a study of uh, SQM uh, meters and they, they felt that uh, spectral response affected readings. Uh, in fact, they said that uh, in in many cases with the LED lights, that the uh, SQM readings are are inflated at in actual fact. So that might explain the higher uh, abundance of these uh, higher deviations, which mean perception. I mean, by reading, it means that the reading was darker, but in actual fact, it may not be. So I didn't. Then I just took um, uh, a spatial vis visualization with. Uh, QGIS, which is the GIS software I used last time. And this was quite useful to do. What I did was I, the magenta ones are the original 2010, and the 2022 data points are actually in green. And, and you'll notice that um, uh, some of them are quite coincident, which means that people went more or less back to the same spot, which is, which is good. Um, any variation is actually detected in this uh, map. So uh, if uh, I was to look at the map more closely and zoomed in, 
I could see how, how far apart they went. Uh, in addition to this, I actually created a spreadsheet which uh, did a difference between 2010 and 2022 coordinates. So uh, I immediately sorted that to see what the deviations were. And somewhere, there were only a few that were very, very close, like within, let's say, 10 feet. And um, the majority were sitting in around maybe uh, maybe 100 to 150 feet away from the original uh, uh, coordinate. But some were radical. And uh, I don't know if I can see it here. I'm going to see if I can get this other image. OK, so you see this point right here, number 99. OK, mm -hmm. that's an example of, I think it must be a typo or something, because the longitude is more or less correct for a reading that's up here, except that uh, there's something wrong with the latitude uh, coordinate. So it drops Reg it right down. can swim. <laughs> no, I don't think I, this. This is not Team B. This is uh, Team G. So he infiltrated so, uh, Team I, I G know. and swam out. Did you? Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, okay. The other thing that the chart tells you is that these ones were kind of brand new, as far as I could see, were brand new coordinates out here in uh, Souk. Uh, and then there were some that I thought were new. But by looking at this map now, I can see that they're probably these ones here. So, you know, I think I, I might consider them to be the same in actual fact. All right. So uh, next steps. Uh, I'm going to basically package uh, uh, a lot of these spreadsheets, intermediate spreadsheets and visualizations. So you can use these to sort of, per, each team should look at these to sort of uh, peruse them to see if the data still makes sense. So in other words, after I've cleaned it and I've done the best I can taking out things like typos and inconsistencies, it's, I wasn't there. So you're gonna have to tell me if they, they seem reasonable, right? Based on some of the material I'm gonna give you. So once you validate that, uh, I will start working on the final visualizations uh, that we will use for public use. So some other issues, um, I'm gonna to continue to work with the data set to improve our data collection processes. There may be some things that we're gonna to have to do to make them more consistent. Uh, uh, Reg actually, uh, I give credit to Reg for this. Uh, he had a suggestion to sort of classify the observations uh, or stratify them into different types of environments. And I think that's a great idea. I haven't done that yet, uh, but he's got a scheme for doing that. Uh, I think three levels, I think. So that might give us some insight about what's happening with the readings as well. Uh, it definitely tells me that we kind of need to uh, better articulate our objectives because obviously if people are going for the darkest spots, they're gonna pick maybe spots other than the ones that we chose in 2010. Uh, so yeah, we should think about them. They're, they're not incongruent, like we, we could do both, uh, but we need to know what people's objectives were when they took the reading. So that's really the important part. Uh, also, we want to uh, probably review the limitations of the older meters, or at least have a better understanding of where they can be utilized uh, more reliably. Uh, for those of you who don't know or are not part of the survey, the older meter, which is this one here, has a much wider cone of acceptance for light. So it's more sensitive to nearby lights. Um, the newer one, which is this one here, uh, with the membrane button, uh, this one has a 20 degree cone. So this is much better. Like uh, I would say for urban environments, this is a much better choice than than this, this other one. Um, the other thing is, I think we need to sort of review the breadth of the survey. It's probably no surprise it took us 12 years to do this again. Uh, it, it is a lot of work. And um, I think we probably should think about uh, should we kind of narrow this down for areas of interest um, uh, or maybe at least shorten the time period between surveys? Now, this is the article that I mentioned. This is from the Royal Astronomical Society. I'll make sure I, I produce a link somewhere to give you. I, I don't have it readily offhand with me, uh, but it is this paper. And I think it was done in, may have been done in 2016. I don't know the exact date, but this is the one that talks about the potential biasing of uh, of these uh, squim readings 
uh, SQM readings uh, based on spectral uh, content. And of course, this can vary quite a bit. Uh, like every LED light isn't the same. So uh, uh, it, it could vary quite a bit. Anyways, that's the that's my preliminary uh, presentation. Um, do we have any questions? Just a couple of comments, David. Yes. Um, I, I think the, what those meters do with respect to the source light depends on how they're, how they're calibrated. And I don't know what the calibration they, are they, they are calibrated at the factory, and I understand that they may drift over time, uh, given the fact that some of these meters are the original ones that were done in 2010. Maybe they may have drifted. Um, I think another thing I would like to do is maybe get as many of the meters together as we can and, and actually just take readings to see or have an understanding of what the potential offsets might be. Now, there, there is a, 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 a real method of determining whether they're accurate or not, but I don't own a device like that. Yeah, uh, we, would, we, we, we would basically have to send them back to uh, Unihedron. Yeah, it's just, I, I'd be surprised if, if they were properly calibrated at the factory. I'd, surprise, I'd be surprised if they were significantly out in terms of intensity based on spectrum. They, 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 they are recognized as being plus or minus 0.2. Yeah. Uh, so that's typically what they say they are. Uh, the other that, thing that, is the other that thing that across, that'd be across the visible spectrum. So I, I can't imagine that they would inflate the numbers uh, from LEDs because LEDs that mm. you're what you're measuring is in the visible spectrum. Well, uh, see, see, see what you think. Uh, have a look at the have a look at the um, <clears throat> excuse me the article. I'll, I'll post and, that. And and of course within the Victoria area, there's probably there's, there's probably a few uh, high pressure sodiums left. The original ones would have been done mostly with high pressure sodium. And across, uh, depending on which municipality you're in, there's quite a range of color temperatures that the various light fixtures have. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I, I find it hard to believe it, if, if it was due to that, the frequency output of the LEDs, you would expect to see that variation occur more mm -hmm. geographically as well as, <coughs> as in one location. Yeah, let, let, let's let's go back to that chart quickly. Uh, I just want to show you the chart again. Um, let's see if we can find it here. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, this is the th confusing part about it. Now I can understand this, like a lot of them are more or less the same. So this is within, this is the point two uh, yeah. uh, uh, thing that means it's the same. Um, but you'll see they're, they're hugging, hugging this pretty close, right? And, mm -hmm. and maybe, maybe they're a little bit more, but that may be understandable, like with more development, you would expect expect you know lighting to go up a little bit uh these are kind of weird but these are interesting enough these ones are downtown so again maybe they've been increasing a lot of light oh, in these areas yeah, uh, that, for, that, for 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 security that's very likely commercial just straight commercial development oh yeah yeah very likely but we've got a lot more high-rise buildings we have a lot more window uh mm -hmm. escapement uh, yeah. So you're going to downtown and and in high development areas, you're going to see that. Yeah, I'm just I just want to make sense of, of the data. Uh, I think it's an interesting exercise. I mean, we'll just go through, you know, through our comments and go through the uh, the data set and and look at the values that we got, like what the deviations actually were, and you know, we'll just see if we can make some sense of it. Yeah, David. Anyways, yeah, good comments. Yes. What is the Geographic distribution, the ones that are getting darker by more than two units. I'm not sure. I'd have to look at the spreadsheet that, to, to that, tell. That would be interesting to know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is your preliminary report because we are really keen to see your next report. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to get together with the teams. I would just want to, uh, there, there is an, uh, an essence, a, a level of validity that has to be placed here. I, I have to get the teams to sort of more or less say, yeah, this makes sense. And then we'll start looking at all the locations and looking at all the values to see if they make sense, right? Yeah. <clears throat> let, let, Leslie, you have a question? Uh, a comment that you may wish to further comment on. Uh, of course, all of the meters back from the first set of observations were the original meters and had exactly the they were they were the ones that were used yes they so were the ones that were used one might expect or this is this is my hypothesis about the new meters is that in similar locations where there aren't specific phenomenon such as directly impacting light or something like that just just in general you might expect that the smaller cones would have darker readings and yes that's yes. that's what seems to be coming out of the data so yeah yeah the comparability and, and, and is an issue exactly and uh oh, oh absolutely and and if this spectral difference is true uh yeah we, we can't go back and reach that far back now moving forward there's no problem right but reaching back there's various reasons uh not only the meter type the the difference in the cone but but also possibly spectral differences but no, actually, very, very good uh, hypothesis. Any were, other questions? Were any photographs of the site locations taken? No. No. I I expected that we were already overloading teams. Yeah. So I wasn't going to ask them to do that. Um, I would have, but I wasn't going to do that. Um, yeah. I, think, uh, I think when you're dealing with a volunteer force, uh, we can only ask so much yeah. and uh it, it's it's the same rule of thumb that people use for surveys don't ask too many questions you'll never get the survey back <laughs> and if we ask people to do too many things they're going to make mistakes so you kind of have to uh uh weigh weigh the benefits benefits of additional things now D david um uh photographs can be a post thing there's no reason why we can't go back to these places right and photograph them. Yeah, and I'm thinking, you know, a uh, uh, fisheye, all sky lens pointed up. Yep, absolutely. And a select number of locations might give us a better handle on why we get those variations. Yeah, so this is supposed to open up a whole bunch of little projects uh, for us to understand the data better. I mean, the whole thing was to uh, create uh, an element of discovery in this, like for us as a group, to go and collect some data, analyze it, and see if we can make sense of it. So if if it's nothing else, that's a win for me. I think that's that's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, David, I think uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing what uh, what other uh, information you can squeeze out of this data set. It sounds like uh, you're well on your way to uh, developing. Uh, yeah, and and Jim, Jim, you mentioned. Jim, you mentioned that you have some uh, experience with QGIS. Yes. Yeah, if you want, if you want to help me, uh, you're welcome to do so. I was uh, I was looking at your data sets there, and uh, my first thought was that it would be interesting to see it as a heat map across the area. Yes, then... I, I I saw that. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, light pollution. In fact, I found a light pollution site with a heat map, and it doesn't look too far off from this actually, mm -hmm. and I would expect it to. Because what 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 I did was with with the heat map from this website, I just clicked on points that I knew, like I clicked on Cattle Point, it was pretty close. It was pretty well the reading that they said on their on their site. It so, would be interesting uh, to see a heat map as well of the change from the uh, the original twenty ten and and this current one. So that yeah. would be uh, interesting as well. I don't know how to do a heat map yet, but I will find out. Okay, I, I know I did one once uh, a year or two back, and so I'm pretty sure that I could figure out how to well, do it. Well, maybe maybe you can go on the hunt as well. I'll look uh, I'll look into it. Okay, thanks. Anyway, we'll leave it uh, at Brian? that. Uh, Brian, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, that was about Cattle Point. Did you did the results show or confirm where the best dark spot, dark sky spots are? I don't know. Is Reg, is, is Reg here? Yes. Am I allowed to say anything? <laughs> Yes, you, you you have my permission to speak, David. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I have a spreadsheet. I can sort it and I can tell you the darkest spot. Um, okay. I'll tell you. Uh, Souk, darkest spots. Some areas of the Sandwich Peninsula, very good. Hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, the, the closer you are to development, the worse it is. So the areas that are really dark are places where there is nobody and no lights, right? So uh, Catapoint seems to hold its own, but I would say I would classify it as Urban Star Park. I would definitely call it Urban Star Park. It is not a dark sky site. Yeah, I can uh, confirm that about Souk as well. The few times that I've been out there uh, hauling the gear out with me, it's it's been a very good location. Yeah. Yeah, there's no surprises there, really. You, you don't need this data to know that. <laughs> but it's interesting, though, right? I mean, I did I did, did some sorts, and I could see where the best ones are and where the worst ones are. Uh, I think Margie and um, Susan went to the worst spots. They were in urban sprawls, so they had the worst readings. How does it look just north of Sanderson, David? Uh, let me have a look. Just I'm about here. to spend money there. Oh, okay. <laughs> David, how much you do you want to pay? Uh, you can do that as well. Yeah. Um, I can, show you, uh, I can yeah, say. Yeah, why don't, why don't you go ahead and start with yours? Okay. Now, I should let people know uh, QGIS is not a magic tool. Uh, I, I noticed that, that, that uh, when I presented the data, Randy, it, I just shoved it into, I think, Google Map or something. You did a KML or something with it. Yeah, I made hey, a KML of uh, deciles. This is every 10 percentile. And yep. uh, I put it on Google Earth. And so, so the, be um, the, be the best ones are orange, right? No, the, the magentas here. So up in the high. Oh, sorry, magentas, magentas, yeah. Up here at Land's End. Yeah. It's actually kind of surprising considering the ferry terminal, isn't it? It, it is, <laughs> but it's it's density, though. You know, and I think that's soon. what the difference is. But uh, we're. Um, Gary, where's your area? Uh, I'm in Sanageton, which is uh, uh, where, your, where your pointer is. Yeah, about there. Yeah. Just up a little. Bit. So, yeah, right around there. Right, right, right around there. Yeah. Right there. So you got a red, which is very good, uh -huh. next to a green, which is middling. What about okay. the yellow one? That's closer to the highway. Yellow is, is getting better. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. good. And then and the I, one that, that uh, Reg is trying to keep secret is here. Yeah, golf course. No. Yeah. It's well, uh, that's Reg's house. <laughs> no, I think I, I'm thinking of that I know what that was uh, because it would have been ours. And I'll, I'm thinking that it's probably the, is it the Gonzales Observatory? Uh, no. Uh, the, the one that Reg is talking about is a spot that he's scouted and Ooh. it's it, it has a very good rating it's and in the 20s the totem pole the totem pole in Beacon Hill Park that's that good. that's a mistake I I know that's a mistake um oh there there's a totem pole on a flagpole and I think Margie recorded the totem and did not redo the flagpole so they I think we, it's it's the other way around we oh we, it's the other way around okay we, we recorded the flagpole and then when we tried to go back and, and record the totem pole, uh, we couldn't yep. because the gate was closed. All right. Anyways, I can reconcile that in the data. I, I'm going to have to work with the, every team and just make sure that we've got the right readings for the right places. So that's what we have to do still. Okay. Well, it sounds like there's definitely more work to be done. So, it, Oh, uh, plenty. Plenty. Look, looking forward to seeing how that works out. So. Great. Right, thanks. Anyway. If, uh, Laurie, you have a hand up here. Did you want to ask a quick question before we move on to uh, Nathan's uh, film? Oh, I was I was just going to say um, that um, uh, up at the, I did the ones way up on the, on the top and uh, the one magenta one was Ocean Spray, uh, Ocean Spray Boulevard right at the very end of um, West Saanich Road. And there wasn't a light to be had anywhere. There are no lights in the area, even though there are 
there are houses, but they're few and far between, and there was just not a light to be seen. It was absolutely wonderful. And the other one around the corner where somebody said, well, isn't that by the ferry terminal? That's actually, um, it's actually kind of right around in Curtis Point. And again, uh, quite quite a dark spot, not very not very many houses and um, uh, and and a fairly a fairly dark spot that 106 um, is a is a is a is a pretty darn dark spot and 105 is like was terrific so yeah. Very well notes for uh, future trips. So Jim. Yes. I, I I'm aware of how hard David uh, has worked on this, and I, I really appreciate all the effort he's put into it. Mm -hmm. And if he's planning another survey, I think he should hold off for another data course that he can take at the same time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a uh, there's a second part. To, uh, Camosun College has a uh, second uh, ArcGIS uh, um, course, and I took the first one which was very interesting and I learned a lot. So uh, perhaps we'll see if, uh, if David takes the uh, second data analysis course, I can see if I can line up the uh, second GIS course and we'll see what we can do together. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, moving along, uh, Nathan, you have your uh, a film that you wanted to present. It's uh, Seeing Further, I see it from the title and I didn't get a chance to look at it to uh, see exactly what it was about. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about uh, what you produced. Sure, yeah. Um, it's a little different than the cartoons that I usually do. Um, it's a vision that I've had for a long time actually. Um, and when the Artemis launch got scrubbed twice, <laughs> It kind of prompted me to make a little manifesto about what will happen once we finally launch Artemis 1 and, you know, perhaps an optimistic view about what the next space age will do to us as a species, um, how once we finally see ourselves as being one and the same on this one planet rather than being in multiple nations on this planet. Um, it will change mindsets around the world. And I was hoping to kind of summarize that in a single film. Whereas of course it will, it will be, um, I mean, everyone will realize it once the launch happens. I just was hoping to put it together just before the launch. Um, and I have some other projects planned for after the launch, of course, but uh, before the launch happened, I wanted to, um, just get everyone's mindsets ready with a hopeful and optimistic vision. Um, now, are, is, is it being played um, there or should I screen share from here? Uh, why don't you screen share from your location when you can play it there? Uh, okay. Um, Okay, um, I do still use the Nerd Anomaly logo, but it's nothing like Nerd Anomaly. I also make my own soundtracks for this. <laughs> 2022, now, finally, we're ready to head back to the moon. Our ambitions are higher than ever, but we're still just drifting out there. Where are we gonna end up? Are we gonna roam the cosmos for billions of years? What is gonna happen once we finally take that giant leap into the universe? If we could land humans on the moon in the 1960s, what are we capable of achieving today? We are about to enter a new global space age and we are never gonna turn back. In the coming centuries, Mars is truly just the beginning. What really is our full potential? we could eventually become a galactic civilization, maybe even intergalactic. But where do we even start? We are more connected on a planetary level than we've ever been before. The world is suddenly accessible to people. It's so easy to forget that we're all just floating out there on this fragile blue planet. But going beyond the Earth, it's more than just an adventure. It's about inspiring the population 
And in fact, it's necessary for the long-term survival of our species. Unfortunately, rockets, once again, are not just being aimed at distant worlds, but between rivaling nations, divided by borders that don't even physically exist on a fragile planet. It's dangerous, the destructive power we've amassed out of conflict, the power to end our entire civilization in one single nuclear tempest. If we aren't careful, we might end the space age before it's even begun. However big you think the universe is, it is bigger than that. So far, we have reached one single planet out of an estimated 10 septillion worlds in the universe. How can we possibly stop with just that? What incredible sights await us out there? Billions of planets, each with their own mountains and skies, oceans, sunrises and sunsets, their own stars, their own moons, perhaps even alien life forms, all of which we may never know. Faced with the staggering amount of the universe we may never visit, it instills a sense of absolute insignificance. But we can't forget that we are part of it too. We are made of star stuff. We have existed for such a fleeting instant in the story of the universe. And yet in that time, we've managed to understand it, to understand our place in it. And we've reached it ourselves. We built a space station. We've been to the moon before, and now finally, we're going back. One day, we will travel to other stars, most certainly not during our lifetimes, but one day people will. And whoever they are, they're actually depending on us this century to kickstart the next space age and take that jump into the universe. Even if we're headed for other stars, where exactly are we going to end up? In the end, there doesn't have to be any deep meaning to it. If for nothing more than to satisfy our curiosity, our urge to explore, why wouldn't we want to strive for intergalactic civilization? Even if there's no big purpose to it, why wouldn't we want to set foot on other worlds, travel to other stars, and become a meaningful part of the universe? And maybe one day, we'll be out there. We'll take that giant leap into the universe, and we'll never turn back. The fundamental rule in this universe is that everything ends. Stars burn out, planets disintegrate. Everything eventually dies. So let's hope that in the quadrillion or so years we have to prosper in this universe, we extend our reach as far as possible, traveling to other stars, other galaxies. Let's hope that by the time the last human is born, we have extended to the farthest corners of the cosmos. And let's hope that the end isn't here on Earth after some nuclear war but out there in the most spectacular universe imaginable. We have the privilege of being alive in the universe's golden age. And once we return to the moon, we will not stop there. If we work together as a species, build on each other's ideas and never stop exploring, the gateway to the universe is open. Thank you very much, Nathan. It's very interesting that the uh, uh, dedication to uh, Carl Sagan at the end. I was uh, reminded of that film that was produced a short time ago called uh, Wanderers, that uh, was uh, done with yes. uh, uh, the the uh, animation and, and graphics over top of uh, a quote, a long quote from uh, from Sagan, which uh, is very similar. Very nice. Thank you. Wow! Did that? Did you get that done before breakfast or what? Like good <laughs> How long? How long did that take, Nathan? That was amazing. Oh, thank you. Uh, it took me about a week. 
all together with the music and the video editing. Thankfully, I didn't have to render each one of those scenes because I mostly just composed it out of stock video online. Um, I mean, it works. Those websites like Pixabay and stuff, they have good stuff. <laughs> nice editing, by the way. I used to be in that business and good video editing. Thank you. <laughs> So I'd like to tell everybody that um, if you listen to it at home, it sounds way better. <laughs> the uh, Zoom rendered the music, uh, you know, it, it, I guess it favors the, the talking. And so we could not actually hear the music that Nathan composed, which is remarkable. I loved it. Very Thank nice. You. Very well done. Um, now, uh, Randy, did you have uh, something more you wanted to add about uh, gamma, uh, gamma ray burst you mentioned? I sure do. Let's share the screen again. I spent far too much time this weekend because I just love the story. Come on. We can do it. We can do it. Here we are. So, uh, gamma ray bursts. Uh, there was this event a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's been quite amazing watching uh, the reaction in the astronomy community. And uh, I spent a lot of time just to find out what the story is, because I did not know anything about gamma ray bursts until until this event just happened. So um, strangely enough, the story starts with the partial test ban treaty in 1963. There is this kind of crazy time in the 50s that uh, USSR and USA were um, putting, they were doing these atmospheric tests and putting all of these isotopes into, into the atmosphere. And uh, in 1963, they put a stop to them. And from then on, really, it was just French and Chinese tests. Um, but there was a lot of mistrust between the uh, nations. And so um, one way of monitoring is to look for gamma rays. And so uh, the clever people at Los Alamos lab uh, designed these um, Vela program satellites. They put up two at a time and they measured gamma rays. And uh, by getting the different timing, you could triangulate to where the source was. And, uh, you know, usually they could figure out what the sources were. There's lots of uh, events that they, they, they could understand. But um, when there was something that was really weird, they just put it in the file of, I don't know. And uh, this was the first one. In 1967, uh, they saw this absolutely huge event that took about uh, eight seconds. And it was just filed away at the time because they had no idea where it came from. But um, by 1973, they had 16 of these uh, very energetic uh, outbursts um, and uh, they got permission to publish it in the civilian uh, press. And uh, they said it is um, cosmic origin. They figured it was not from anything in the, uh, on the earth or in the, um, in the solar system. Well, then the next important thing, you know, uh, in 1990, Hubble was uh, launched, but it was one of a whole series of great space telescopes. And uh, this one is the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory that was launched the next year. And uh, this burst and transient source experiment was the one that uh, really changed things. And uh, 
this was one of the events. So first of all, just take a look at the background. The, the, the um, you know, the, this diagram here, the part that doesn't move, that is the normal gamma ray intensity centered on the Milky Way disk. And you can see that most gamma rays are coming from the disk of the Milky Way. And then at this particular time, this was this 10 second period, this event way off in the middle of nowhere um, is about as bright as the whole rest of the universe put together. And they um, compiled all of these events and the, the sizes of these dots are proportional to how bright the events are. And the remarkable thing is it's isotropic. Iso means same, trope direction. So when you say something is isotropic, it's the same in all directions. And the Milky Way is not isotropic. The Milky Way is all on this one plane. And so what is the uh, mechanism? I mean, gamma rays are very high energy. It is very difficult to produce gamma rays. And uh, so um, there is kind of two camps. There is the people said that it has to be really close to us uh, because you know, we see stars in all directions around the Earth. And so these must be local events. And the major argument they had is that uh, if they are from deep space, they're just too darn bright. And then the other people were saying, well, actually, they're just these absolutely amazing uh, explosions that, that are doing it. And I, I really like this story. In 1920, there was the great debate where they um, had uh, these two guys, uh, Shapley and Curtis, argue about whether nebula were um, within the galaxy, within the Milky Way or not. And it, it was undecided. At the end of the debate, the um, people who said that, that was Shapley who said that there are these island universes out there, what we now call galaxies, um, are far outside the Milky Way. And uh, Curtis said, no, everything are like uh, nebula. They're, they're fuzzy things that are within. And it was only in 1922 that Hubble recognized that the, um, the uh, variable stars on the Andromeda galaxy showed that Andromeda was outside the Milky Way. And that decided it. But it was after uh, there was this kind of crisis in astronomy. So on the 75th anniversary of the first great debate, here's a kind of similar one where they, in Harvard, they got together uh, the, the people who were studying this and they had one person, uh, Lamb on the left, say that the events, these uh, gamma ray bursts are within the galaxy and uh, Pazniski, uh, argued that they were outside and they put it to a vote at the end of this uh, this event and it was 50-50. <laughs> well, then in 1996, this is an Italian Dutch uh, satellite that uh, could detect X-rays and then it would slew around once it set, figured out where the, the source was and then take a picture. And uh, the very next year, so it's called the GRB, is uh, Gamma Ray Burst, 1997, February 28. And there you see that it has this kind of X-ray afterglow. But what was wonderful is it beamed down the coordinates to, to Earth. And at the um, William Herschel Telescope, uh, on the Canary Islands, they saw, they found the event, this thing here, and over the uh, next week and a half or so, it disappeared. So this was the first time that they actually saw the afterglow and they could uh, see uh, where this 
uh, this came from. And it uh, was from a galaxy that was far away. And that proved that they, it's the uh, deep space. And oh yeah, what really did it is that they figured out what the host galaxy of this explosion was, and it was eight billion light years away using the Hubble as for, for the spectroscopy. Absolutely fantastic. So um, here, somebody in uh, 2001 did this uh, compilation of all the publications about gamma ray bursts. So until 1973, it wasn't a thing. That's when uh, the Velos uh, paper came out and it just kept growing and growing. And I don't know what this graph would look like now, but I am sure that exponential growth is continuing on because uh, then uh, they started launching more satellites that could measure it. And then there's this whole worldwide network. And the story, there's actually two ways that these things happen. I'm only gonna talk about this one. The other one is um, neutron stars that, that collide and they, they do what are called short gamma ray bursts. But for long gamma rays, they it's these stars, 30, 100 times the mass of the sun, that um, when you're when they're that big, then they go through their whole life cycle in like 10 million years, like that, says the geologist. Um, and they burn up their hydrogen into helium, into carbon, and they keep fusing molecules until they get up to iron. Iron is the um, least heavy, uh, per nucleon element. We'll talk about that some other day if you want to hear about it. But basically, you can keep combining nuclei until you turn it into iron. And then there's nothing that can happen. And so it just loses its energy source. And then you've got all this material out there that goes under gravity and bangs down on itself, creates a black hole. And if it's spinning, which many of them are, then the magnetic field of this um, accretionary uh, disk gets um, focused along those lines of uh, collapsed magnetic field. And you get these two beams going along the pole. And so instead of the energy spreading out as inverse square, like, like normal light, it goes down inverse linear. It just goes down as the distance instead of the distance squared. And so it's a huge amount of energy and it's focused. And if that beam happens to intersect the earth, we see it. So what I heard is there's like one uh, supernova per second in the universe, but there's about one of these things per year. And most of them are not pointing at the earth. And so what they're doing right now with the satellites that, they, that we have up there, they're detecting about two a week, something like that. Anyway, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. Anyway, let's come to uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And by crazy coincidence, the people who uh, worked on data from the Fermi um, satellite, I uh, got together for the 10th International Fermi Symposium on October 9th in, in uh, Johannesburg. And they're all very happy because as soon as they got there, um, the Fermi satellite found this huge event. Okay, so it has this gamma ray burst monitor and at uh, 116, 59, so, uh, you know, just in the early afternoon universal time, uh, there was this nice little burst. And then three minutes later, this was the boat, the biggest of all time. They've never had as big a uh, burst as this one. And then it slewed around and the large area telescope took this picture of it. 
Amazing, eh? So that is the, um, here we have the Milky Way disk. It was very close to the, uh, the plane of the Milky Way. And it's about as bright as the rest of the Milky Way, or it's probably much brighter. Okay, so that was Fermi. Then there's the satellite called SWIFT. And about an hour later, it saw the same event. And the way that SWIFT notes it is not by the uh, date, it does by the coordinates. So this is the, um, the hour and the declination. And uh, it, it has these three different um, instruments on it. And for anybody who doesn't know, if for the like real time exciting news in astronomy, you can follow it on the Astronomer's Telegram. So this is, this is just a um, place where people say, here's something important that I just saw and uh, you should pay attention. It's especially for transients, especially for telling the people with their big telescopes, I just saw a supernova or something. They put it on the Astronomer's Telegram and then all these, uh, these uh, telescopes around the world stop what they're doing and go take a look because they want to, to get this early information after the transient happens. And then in particular for gamma rays, there's the gamma ray burst coordinate network, sorry, um, circulars. And uh, this is just focused on the gamma ray bursts. And um, I just went through them this weekend. It was just, it was really fun. So I'm going to actually go through this a bit. So the GCM, this, this circular 32632, that's the first one. And it was published at 239 universal time. And this was from the SWIFT. So this was the second um, satellite that saw it. And with their burst, so the, their gamma detector, they gave the location to within three arc minutes uncertainty. And then a couple of minutes later with their X-ray telescope, they got it down the precision to 5.6 arc seconds. And then about three minutes on, then they had it to uh, you know, 0.6 arc seconds. So that's really good. That's about the, what, what the field of view of a big um, terrestrial uh, telescope. So, so other, they can, they beam that down to the world. And so at 1439, they told everybody, hey, you better take a look at this place. Now, this is interesting. This, this was circular. I'll just do the last three digits, 632. Then it was later circular 635 that the Fermi telescope, which I guess takes longer to process these things, it said that it found a burst, and the, the, this is what it said in the, uh, in the circular, a highly energetic outburst, and therefore we strongly encourage follow-up of this unusual event. It's so polite. Anyway, the time that they gave for it was about, um, well, what is it, 54 minutes before the um, SWIFT. And I still haven't figured out what it is that why the um, Fermi event is so much before the SWIFT event. Um, maybe the SWIFT was just on the wrong side of the earth when that happened. That, that's something I'm looking forward to. Anyway, then it is 636, which came out a bit later that said that the Fermi event and the SWIFT event actually are in the same part of the sky. Okay. And, you know, I went through, the, these are just the first ones. There are actually 108 as of this morning. I don't know if there's been more since this morning. So that was that 632, the 635, you know, they, they, these, are, these are the, I, I just found the ones that either gave the Swift catalog number or the Fermi catalog number, and I compiled them together. Um, and then I want to particularly show you this one. This is uh, from, uh, well, I'm gonna show you next. So this is what these circulars look like. Uh, there's lots of authors. Um, 
So this was the next morning at nine in the morning, okay, on the 10th. Um, and so this was at the very large telescope in Chile, and it's about 11 hours, well, 12 hours after the Fermi trigger and 11 hours after the uh, Swift trigger, but they were able to identify in the spectrum calcium and sodium, and that they were redshifted by Z equals 0.151, and um, that's about 2 billion light years, which is actually really close for one of these gamma ray bursts. So that's part of the reason it was a big explosion and it's close. And that's why it's the it's the boat. It's the biggest of all time. I took the coordinates, put it into Stellarium, and uh, it's kind of cool. It's right in the middle of the summer triangle. But you see, it is actually in the Milky Way. So it's just glancing through a whole bunch of the Milky Way to get to us. And... I don't understand this figure. I got to tell you, they've seen this several times uh, with these with these bursts. These are X-rays that are scattered off, not anything close to the actual um, event. This is scattered off gas in the nether reaches of the Milky Way, and I don't understand the physics of it, but they're beautiful. So this is from the X-ray telescope on the Swift. And I, I just love this. So this guy working on Swift, and take a look, this is at eight in the morning, universal time. I don't know, it's a Twitter, it might be local time on the 10th. I don't know what that seven or eight in the morning uh, means, whether it's um, in the United States or would it be uh, eight hours earlier. In any case, um, let me read it out. This is his, twi his uh, Twitter. Swift detected a gamma ray burst yesterday. It's bright, really bright, like stupidly really bright. It turns out my analysis codes weren't really built for things like this. So, and this this is the picture that he, he put with his thing. So these are all sorts of um, time since burst and the energy, erg centimeter per centimeter squared per second. <laughs> Okay, that is, he doesn't use SI units, he uses CGS units. But they're, they're down here, this is a log scale. So you can see, because he's working with Swift and you go down, he starts his measurement about 3000 seconds or about an hour after the, the burst. So clearly it's the Fermi time is the beginning of the burst and Swift didn't start seeing it until an hour later. So that, that's one thing I understand from that. Let me go back. And so it would have been way up here in the, in, you know, like way off scale. And that's why they're calling this the boat, the biggest of all time. And because of that, there's like all the telescopes in the world stopped what they were doing and have gone and are taking a look at it. It is the most studied event right now in professional astronomy but also in amateur astronomy. I just love this. And so for our ham colleagues in the, in the room, uh, this guy, Andrew uh, um, he apparently, and you got your hams in the, in the room can tell me better, but often you have neighbors that don't like you putting up a big aerial, but what you can do is put um, uh, rods into the ground and use the earth as your antenna. His is 75 meters long. So he just has this, um, you know, this um, shielded uh, wire for 75 meters from his house and the other one is near his house. And he likes to monitor these VLF, very low frequency transmitters. And he saw this, um, the blue line here, that is the strength of the signal coming from uh, far away. And the um, in orange is from the swift uh, measurements. And uh, you see that they are just a perfect, perfect fit. And the only one that didn't show it 
was on the far side of the Earth. So the actual ionosphere was bumped by these gamma rays. And he says he's been doing this for 30 years, and this is the first time he's seen this. So um, gamma ray bursts, 2022, October 9th, uh, is a major event, and it's been fun watching it. And we're going to hear more about it. The astronomers are delighted. It's a real probe into how the universe works. Thank you very much, Randy. That's uh, that's very interesting, especially the note at the end there. Uh, <laughs> being a ham operator here, we've really been struggling over the last couple of days with uh, horrible HF conditions. Uh, and it's the ionosphere that's uh, causing the problems. And I was hoping that uh, I would be able to say that uh, that would uh, your gamma ray burst would explain it. But unfortunately, uh, at the time of the uh, time of the gamma ray burst, we were having very good uh, <laughs> long distance transmission. However, it is interesting about the uh, receiving the uh, VLF um, with the uh, ground spikes like that. Uh, that's uh, uh, one area that I, I have been interested in and. Uh, Curiously, that's uh, also what the uh, getting back to the comprehensive test ban treaty organization. That's uh, one of the uh, systems that they they monitor, and they also oh. monitor uh, infrasound with uh, very low frequency sound detectors as well to look for uh, the atomic blasts. So they're uh, they're kind of coming into this in uh, several different ways. But uh, but thank you very much for that presentation. That was very very interesting. Did anybody yeah, have like any seeing questions? amateurs doing good science? <laughs> Did anyone have any questions they'd like to bring up? David, I see your hand up there. I think it's just an applause. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank Gary's you, David. Gary's great. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, as soon as you said one hour later, I, I, I said, how can that possibly be? So do you know anything more about that? No, I've been looking, Gary. I, it's it's very surprising. These are very sensitive spaceships. Um, but gamma rays, the reason that they don't do gamma ray work on Earth is the atmosphere protects us, OK? Um, there is a very interesting thing. There's uh, the Ordovician extinction 450 million years ago has some very strange um, uh, characteristics, and they think that a gamma ray burst, the local one in the Milky Way, may have been uh, what, what could have caused that. But basically, our atmosphere protects us from gamma rays. And so, you know what, it was just during my talk now, I was wondering, is it possible that uh, these spaceships, if they're on the wrong side of the Earth from where the event happens, they just don't see it? Okay. It might be a good reason why we have two of them up there. And how long are their orbits? I don't know how, what they're, you know, this is the sort of thing that uh, I'm sure the information's out there, but uh, that that hour is very surprising. Yeah. If, uh, if one of them, the later one was looking through the atmosphere that uh, could have, or, or was shielded by the planet, that could easily account for that hour. Um, Interestingly, the uh, the effects on the atmosphere are showing up in uh, uh, snow layers in Greenland. They've uh, researchers have started looking for uh, higher concentrations of certain isotopes of um, atmospheric gases that uh, result from uh, the uh, nearby gamma ray bursts, and they're uh, actually finding some uh, traces that strongly indicate that uh, we we've had. Uh, uh, even more recent, like in the last uh, a few million years, gamma ray bursts. Oh, okay. What's the effect but, on people in the ISS? Ah, uh, I don't know, but I do. I can report that it was the first time a new telescope on the ISS was used for for these sorts of observations. They just commissioned it. Um, and it slewed to to this location after the uh, the report came out. But uh, yeah, they are not protected by the atmosphere. The the people who are living up there. I know that this is one of the big problems for 
um, talk of sending people to Mars. The ISS is within the Van Allen radiation belt. And I think that will provide some of the protection. But uh, once you're outside the Earth's magnetosphere, then you're really not protected at all. This is something that, uh, what's his name, Robert Thirst talked about a bit during his talk. Very good. Very good. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, did anybody else have anything they wanted to uh, add or any questions for any of our presenters this evening? Uh, Jim, I'm just I'm just going to pop in the URL for that uh, spectral responsibilities. There you go. Okay, you see that. Okay, I can announce that I will be hosting next week as um, we were saying earlier on, it's Halloween next Monday. And I, so, so Chris, they're turning it into a haunted house here? Yeah, they're gonna set up um, the uh, in the youth space here, a haunted house. And they're not sure they're gonna have time to uh, uh, undo it. So um, we've, uh, kindly agreed that we won't be here in person next week, but we will be on Zoom. So I figure uh, I will be handing out candies, but I don't think it's that incompatible because so few kids come around. Although maybe now that COVID's over, we'll have more. Um, but also there will be a beautiful quarter moon and it will be clear skies like it is every Halloween. And so um, it's a great outreach possibility. So if nobody comes next week because it's a clear sky and you have your telescope out, I think that would be awesome. And that's a possibility as well. <laughs> okay. And, oh, and I want to say one more thing. The following week, so not the Monday, but the Tuesday morning, is the lunar eclipse starting at one in the morning, going till four. Um, and it's going to be clear that night, right? And uh, yes, I hope so. I'm very keen to um, work on crater timing, and uh, I, I'm hoping that Nathan will come and do a, a uh, sleepover with me. Uh, <laughs> but if anybody else wants to, uh, I'm very keen to uh, to do that. It depends how you phrase it. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Two hands up there too, I see Jim. Lori was first. Yes, I just wanted to say, um, still taking uh, any orders for calendars. Uh, we have we've ordered them, um, so they're coming. And but um, but I can I still have got some extra. I've bought a few extra, so if you want one or two or three, let me know and just uh, just email me and I'll put you down. I also have ordered a couple of extra um, uh, Explore the Universe workbooks or Explore the Moon workbooks. And they're about $10 a piece or something like that. And they just have all the all the all the places so that you can do all of your um all of your observations if you'd like to do the explore the moon or explore the um explore the universe certificate so i have those and you're you're welcome to um to have those uh to get those from me as well so i'll let you know as soon as i get them it seems to me i've heard seen i've heard this before yeah okay like last year but i'm sure that it's a little bit better so it's okay who has their handbook mine arrived this week thank you mm. I know okay. some handbooks have arrived in various places. Um, so uh, it, it, like randomly kind of across Canada. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Um, also, Only eight months after my last one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, also, you may not know, I'm not sure whether it's uh, fully known yet, but Lalendria uh, Brunes um, is now not um, with um, Sky News. Uh, magazine she's she has uh, um, 
uh, retired as the editor and has gone on to do some work with Parks Canada. And there has been a new person who has just been put in as the editor. So it will, it probably will be a, a little bit um, to, um, to get that all in order. I don't, is Chris online tonight? I don't see him. I think he was in Vancouver. So. Okay, right. So he he may have some more information for next time. Uh, I believe he had mentioned at a previous meeting that there was also a printing problem this month. Because I don't know if anybody's gotten a Sky News magazine yet, but it's I think it's running a bit late for the November, December issue. Okay. Yeah, I think there was there was there was something it was the it yes, was yes, they they're the like the now past publisher has been <laughs> dropped because this they jacked up the prices astronomically to make a minor pun. So they've gone with a new publisher, like a new printer. So that might delay it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And there's a little bit of staffing turmoil at national office right now. People have been sick and things are delayed a bit. So, and there's maternity leave and all that stuff. So the fun stuff. So, so I just wanted to say that I just got back from, well, the Brandy, did you just say COVID is over? Um, no. Yes. Okay. I thought I heard that something like that. Now that COVID's over. Um, COVID is less over. <laughs> Well, yeah. there's more people in the hospital at this time of year than in the last two years with COVID, but that's oh. not the point. And I was just in an event two weeks ago, Whistler, and seven people in our group of volunteers there at the Mushroom Festival came down with COVID. So uh, I'm hoping I didn't get it because I just got back from the Whistler Dark Sky Festival. It was really a lot of fun. I uh, spent a lot of the time hanging out with the group from Edmonton doing outreach stuff and solar and nighttime. And I saw a live drone display. That was really cool. It's better than fireworks because mm -hmm. there was all this neat music going on with it. And there was like no explosions and no smoke to suck in or anything like that. It was, it was mystifying as to how they do it. Like there must be way more drones up there at any one time that are actually showing themselves because I don't believe they could move around the sky that far. It mystified us. It was really big. I think that every hotel room in Jasper was full. It was just crazy. There were so many people. So it was a lot of fun. I'd suggest that if you're going to go up there. What was the event? Take the a telescope. Event? It's called the Jasper Dark Sky Festival. They've been doing it for a little over a decade now. That it's a week long event and various things are going on. And I know Alan Dyer was there last week, like the weekend before doing, you know, talks on how to do Aurora photography and night sky photography. And there are all sorts of different talks and stuff. I met up with one guy from, cause my wife didn't want to go. So I gave, cause I won this at the GA two years ago. So always sign up, always sign up for the GA because there's a chance to win a prize that's worth quite a bit of money. <laughs> Although I had to get myself there and I caught the 11 o'clock ferry coming back. So it was, and that was like the voyage of the damned. It was people sleeping all over the, sleeping all over the ferry with soft coughing going on everywhere. I hid in a corner because <laughs> I couldn't get down to my car. But, I'm, yeah, uh, but the, I'm taking, I'm taking the the bus into work and I'm making sure that I'm wearing a mask while I'm on public transit. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'd wear a bubble on measures. my head. Yeah. So, but it was fun. It was worth it. It was worth the, you know, 20, 2000 kilometers of driving. And so. Wow. Marjorie, uh, you have your hand up. I do. Uh, do uh, folks know that there was a um, AGM for uh, FDAO on Saturday night and both Lori and David uh, were given awards. Oh. I missed that. <laughs> Thank you. And I have a lovely, I have a lovely new JWST pin. 
cool. that was given to me from NASA. So there we go. Very nice. Thanks, Margie. Okay, well, uh, oh, Nathan, you had uh, something you were going to say. No, I was just using the uh, applause. Oh, I see. Pandemony. Congratulations. Yes. We, do, we need a, a differentiation between sticking a hand up or the, the a hand up icon and the applause icon. <laughs> I, I think it's just the orientation, Jim. <laughs> don't, don't tilt your head. I am going like this. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, isn't there, there's a TV ad on now, but somebody putting up a picture and uh, with trying to put the, uh, get it level and they set the level on top and it slides off to one side. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if that is, uh, I don't know if anybody else has anything else they would like to add, but uh, I think we're getting pretty close to nine o'clock. No, we're past nine o'clock here by one minute. Oh, so, Jim, uh, Jim, I think, is Dave here? There, there's um, Astro Photos like tomorrow. No, not on tomorrow, on, on Wednesday. Yes. yes, yes, I did see that. <clears throat> yeah, I and, also and then, uh, like to reserve a little time on uh, the next uh, uh, cafe just to give a little bit of report of some of the work that's been done by the AP group. So if we could reserve a little 15 to minutes to half an hour would be great. Yeah. So Dave, uh, email me because I'll be the host. Okay, we'll do. I actually met the young guy that Dave Robinson is always posting his pictures from Edmonton, Abdur. Yes, he was showing he was showing me pictures that he hasn't even shown to anybody yet. Mm. He's, he's doing some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, he's out at uh, Cochran. He's just a little west of Calgary. Yeah, he moved. Yeah, he moved. Yeah. But he's meticulous in what he does. Okay. Well, if uh, does anybody have anything more they wanted to add? No. Okay. I think perhaps we should uh, call it an evening and uh, say good night. So thank you to everybody who presented, to David, to Nathan, and Randy. Uh, very good work, all of you. So. And thank you, everybody, for coming. So thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Thanks, Jim, for hosting. Good night.